Well, good morning, church. Good morning. So good to see all of you here this morning. Appreciate it very much. Very brisk out there. So you braved the weather and got here anyway and appreciate it. Uh, those who are streaming with us this morning, we certainly appreciate you all being with us as well. Um, I don't have any special announcements to make other than our, those are on our prayer list in our bulletin. So you might want to keep them in your prayers, if you will. Is there anything that I'm overlooking that I need to be aware of? Uh, Brandon Lamar is improving. Brandon Lamar is improving. That's good news to hear. Really went through some serious things there. Anything? Anyone else? Appreciate you being here. Uh, also let you know that I do have the books that we're using for Wednesday night. And uh, I'll pass those out to you after the services. Don't want you to have the book during service, okay? <laughs> Afraid you might get a little distracted there, so we'll pass that out afterwards. I know you're all looking forward to the sermon, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> at least I'm hoping. <laughs> you think we'll stay that long? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> all right. If there's nothing else, I'm going to ask you to bow with me and we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you for everything you do for us, for everything you provided to us. Father, we know that we take many things for granted in this world that we live in, that you provide for us and make available. And we ask that you forgive us, forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of our sins that we commit against you. Intentionally or unintentionally, Father, we just, we know that because of your love, but more importantly because of your son's blood that covers us, that we can come to you to ask for forgiveness and you give it to us. Father, we pray for those who are not here this morning with us. We pray that you'll give them strength, that you'll be able to restore their health that they may once again be part of our body here. We're grateful for our country, for the country that you had inspired men of past to create, to provide the freedom and also to help be self-governed. Father, we are greatly concerned of what things are going on in the current leadership that we have, that we pray, Father, that they may turn to you truly to not recognize that they have all the answers or that they have all of the, the perfections of life. But let them turn to you, Father, for forgiveness and for repentance. And may they turn the country to you for us to be sustained by your power and your glory. Father, we pray that our worship this morning will truly lift you up that we may glorify you, that our faith and our love for one another will be seen and shared. We pray that the songs that we sing will teach us the words that we need to learn to know about you. Pray, Father, that the lesson that we share this morning will also challenge our hearts and our minds to, be, to draw ourselves closer to you and to also understand the strength and the power that you've given us. Now, Father, we ask for your presence in our worship and pray that you will watch over us. For this is our prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. One hundred forty seven. One hundred forty seven. <clears throat> I stand amazed. <clears throat> Shall we sing? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and clean. Your love for me when with the 
ransom in glory his face I at last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my soul shall
each and every one of us this morning. Dear Lord, have thine own way. <clears throat> have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mow me and make me after thy way. sowing the seed. If you'd like to read with me, our scripture reading this morning is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 4 through 9. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I want to let you know that uh, back there in the back, I told James that I had to get a drink of water. We have ice cold water. <laughs> and I said, I drank a piece of ice down by, you know. He said, no, it's not ice. Yes, it's ice. So if you all want some cold water, they're back there for you. It's pretty good. <laughs> Glad you're with us this morning. I hope you'll turn with me to the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter. We're going to pick up a little bit of what we started last Sunday. Last Sunday we looked at chapter 5, verse 21, when it talked about subject yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Subject or, if you will, submit to one another, to Christ. And we talked about that word submit because it required our involvement, our commitment. And sometimes we're afraid to submit. I don't know about you, but I remember years ago, before I got married, I didn't want to submit myself to marriage. But then I had a young lady come along and kind of change my mind. And I was willing to submit to her and to her only. That wasn't, that wasn't hard to do, still not. And now the idea of submitting to Jesus Christ is even a greater challenge. Because none of us ever seen Jesus in the flesh. But we know that he lives. 
We believe that God sent him into the world, that he died on the cross to take away our sins, that he was resurrected, and he gave us a promise that if we would be faithful to him and to the point of death, that he will give each and every one of us our crown of life, that we will live eternally with him. And this promise is very easy to find in the word of God. But we're finding out today that people are turning away from God. And many people are saying to you and me and others that this book we call the Bible is immaterial. It's out of date. It's boring. It doesn't have any relevance to people today. And I think I hope that you and I see differently. Amen. And that we know differently. That this word, this book, has a lot to do to help us in the world that we live in. So when we look at chapter 5, I'm going to change my glasses for a minute so I can really read. Almost looks like the kind I put on, isn't it? <laughs> so you look at verse 22. We're going to read through it and then we'll come back. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is also a head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For the reason, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking in reference to to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must also see to it that she respects her husband. Now I realize that this passage is used quite a bit in weddings, talking about a married relationship, and so for those of you who are maybe either divorced or perhaps single, widow, whatever, you know, I need you to listen to what is being read here. Because the interesting fact that what he's reading to us, telling us in verse 32, is that he's trying to use this marriage relationship to show us the church relationship between the body and Christ. Isn't it interesting how, as he points out being a mystery, that they share the same concept? <coughs> So if you go back to verse 22, when he says, wives be subject or submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I think we have to take a moment and think about what is it that Paul is relating to? In fact, what's the Holy Spirit? Because after all, how can Paul be writing about something that he's never been married? Isn't that fair to say? So he must have something in sight, inside of this that we can look at and examine for ourselves to see really what it is that Paul wants us to understand about this relationship that we have with the church. You've heard me many times say you can't be a lone ranger. And this passage proves it. This passage shows us that we work together. And in a matter, a matter of sense that we as a church are married together. In a different way, in a different light, that we have given ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You have submitted yourself to him. But yet you have the conflicts that are going on in this world. Remember last Sunday I shared with you, we went back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. We saw that the marriage that God created back then 
We saw what was really original and what was God's purpose and intent was made at that point in time. And yet we see what took place over time. In fact, when you think about a husband or a wife submitting to the husband, sometimes people have this picture that the wife is kind of milly mouth, cowering down. That the man is supposed to have the authority and the power. And so that's not what it says here. If you look at verse 21, it talks about being submitting submission to who? One another. And then you look further down and it talks about in verse 33 that wives, you are to what? Respect your husband. Husband, what do you got to do? You got to earn your respect. There's nothing different here. You look at Galatians. Turn over with me to Galatians chapter 3 for a minute. You have to understand a little bit about this relationship that we have with, the G with Jesus Christ and what God has made possible for us and what we as a body of believers have together as well. Now we're talking about two things. We're talking about the body of Christ, His church, and we're talking about marriage, man and a woman. And if you look at Galatians chapter 3, and you're going to look at, if you will, the verse, you can start with verse 27 or 28. 327 says, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Notice that we all have Christ together. But look at verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Notice that we have been, the playing field has been leveled. And there is a level relationship that we have with one another as well as in our marriage. There is a respectful relationship that we're to have to each other. And this respectful relationship finds itself in God's love. And what exactly is God's love? I just want to share a few thoughts with you on that idea. Because one of the things we have in this world, and I, don't, I know I'm guilty of this, as I'm sure you are too. I'm guilty of... What's the word I want to use? When I get frustrated, oh, I get really mad. I get really upset. I don't know what, it may be something that I'm doing. It may be a person or whatever. If it becomes a person and I get frustrated, I have to think about, wait a minute. How often does God get frustrated with me? Amen. How often does God get frustrated with you? How often does God look at your sins and, and yet you look at other people and their sins and, and you kind of hold it against them? Is God holding sins, your sins against you? We're playing an even playing field here. And what we have to understand is that God's love that lives in us is expressed through us to others in how we see them as we see ourselves. You might have to think on that a minute. It's how you see yourself. Do you see yourself in which your sins are fully forgiven? That God, you have a relationship with him. That he has made his abode in you. In Romans chapter 3 verse 22. We're all familiar with 3.23, right? For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But notice what verse 22 says. Even the righteousness of God. Through faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. In other words, he doesn't look at one person a little bit more special than he does another. And yet we become guilty of doing that, don't we, church? We kind of look at other people a little bit differently because maybe we're a little bit able to relate to them or we have a good friendship with them. But yet if somebody else comes along with a different personality, a different life, we, we kind of treat them a little bit standoffish, don't we? But Jesus never did that. He saw the same sin in that person as he does in you, in me. He looks at us as all equal. And he died on the cross to take away all of our sins. And the idea of knowing that God loves us enough to send his son into the world to die for our sins should give us a different perspective on the reality of life in this world. And the reality of life in this world happens to be sin. Though the world doesn't really think of it that way. 
You know, one of the things that yesterday, Maureen gave me a call to talk about my lesson last Sunday that I was trying to show you, I was explaining to her, I was trying to show you this perfect marriage that God created in the Garden of Eden and how it got distorted and how it, how it really dissolved in so many ways. And through the history of man, it has come down. And what she wanted me to point out to everyone was that also all the ugliness and the sin and the sickness and diseases and so forth sprouted out from this garden. And it did. I think we're all aware of that. We know why we're in this world and why this world has gone so array. Because it's not turning to God, it's turning to itself. And the one point that I pointed out to you, if you remember, is that you and I have been given this great gift from God, and that is we can choose what we can and cannot do. What we will or we won't do. Free will. Every one of us. And you have a free will to choose to serve God or not serve God. Hang on to what I'm going to say here in a minute because there's something here that I want us to really get up to about the reality of ourselves in our relationship to God and each other. Because one of the things that we're supposed to be able to do, listen church, is when we come together, it's more than just saying, how's the weather? How you doing? How was your week? I mean, all of that's important and that's great. And a lot of us, we may lie. Yeah, we, we may lie. We may say we had a lousy week where everything's just fine. But we're not going to explain to everybody that we had a lousy week, right? We don't, want to, we don't want everybody to say, oh, well, what's going on? But what we need to be able to do is talk about Jesus. We need to talk about spiritual matters. This is what the body of Christ, is, and even in your marriage. Now, I, I want to point out to you, let's, let's go drop down, if you will, to verse 26 for a minute. Or let's start verse 25. We're going to talk to you husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Will you be willing to die for your wife? That's pretty much what he's saying. But more importantly, the point is that Jesus died for us. And so are we willing to love each other for the fact that Jesus died for you and me? And if you look at verse 26, it says, so that he might sanctify her. You know what that's saying? Make her holy. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. With the word. What's the word, church? Obviously, it's the word of God. It has to do with something with this book we call the Bible. Now, here's my challenge to each and every one of you. And I think it's important we understand. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And what was it that God was trying to tell Moses for the people to do in Israel? Remember? He said, I want you, you, you know, the Lord your God is one God. We all know that. But then he wants you to learn his word. He wants you to place it on your house, your doorpost. He wants you to hang it on your side. He wants you to talk about it. At the table. At the dinner table. He wants you to teach it to your children, men. He wants you to have that responsibility of helping them understand. Who is this God that we worship? Who is this God that gave us life? And what does this God expect from us? It's very clear that we see all of that. And yet, what do we find out? They didn't do it, church. Look with me in Judges chapter 2 for a second. Go all the way back to your Old Testament. In Judges, the book of Judges chapter 2. Now you all know the story in which they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. Because of the fact that they wouldn't go in, they wouldn't trust God in taking over the promised land. You all know the story. You go back to Numbers chapter 13 and 14 and you'll learn about that incident. And so for the next 40 years, they wander in the wilderness. Now they're getting ready to go in to the promised land. And they go in. And Joshua leads the people in this wonderful, how he goes in there. And they start distributing the land that was given accordingly to each clan. Some of them didn't finish that either. And they didn't push all the inhabitants out of that land either, did they? In fact, we find in Judges chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 11 with me. And notice what it says. 
Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals. They started worshiping other gods and not their own God. How did that become that way, church? You need to ask yourself, what caused these people to see that, that little object there was more greater than the God Almighty who created the world and the universe? Because they got away from his word. They weren't teaching it. In fact, we see it here. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. And thus they provoked the Lord to anger. Look at verse 13. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Asherah. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He gave them into the hands of the plunderers and the plundered them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies and around them so that they would no longer stand before their enemies. And wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them so that they were severely distressed. What caused this, church? It's because there was a whole generation, it says, that grew up that did not know God. It's happening today. It's happening today. Why? We shake our heads and think, oh, this is so terrible. Nobody knows God. Did we do what we were supposed to do? Are we teaching our children? Are we teaching our grandchildren? Are we willing to teach other people? Notice it talks about that how is this love of God really learned and known about unless we teach it to each other. I don't think that one hour a week does it. God was talking about them in Deuteronomy that when they sat down at the table, they were to talk about God. Talk about his things. Learn about his commandments. And understand, church, I'm going to say something here and I hope you'll understand what I'm going to say. God's commandments was not given like, oh, you got to do this or else. You understand it was never that way. It was what God wanted you to do because you love God and what he has done for you. There's something that draws us to him. And more so today than ever before, now that we know that Jesus came to this world to die on the cross. And he's taken away your sin completely. And the idea that you, now, you, you are giving yourself to him. And don't you want your children to learn it? Don't you want your wife to know all about these truths about God and leading your children to God? See, that's what Adam didn't do. Remember what happens in the fourth chapter of Genesis? You have two brothers, Cain and Abel. Read that story carefully. How did the family, the first family on earth, get away in this destruction? And where the oldest brother kills the younger. I should say that younger brother kills the older. I get straight. But nonetheless, look what he did. Look at this anger that he had. Because he didn't really care about God. Even though God was reaching out to, to Cain. It's really strange, isn't it? But it's no different than today. We have a choice. But are we in ourselves doing the things so that we might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word? What I want to really look to finally in this subject of the word of God and how important it is for us is looked in Philippians, or excuse me, Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 1, and notice what Paul writes here. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, have you been raised up with Christ? Then keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This is where we're to reach ourselves, church. This is, this is the pinnacle. This is the level. You know, today in our world, people are lowering, lowering the standards. We've lowered them. And here we see that Paul is saying, wait, the standard is up here, not down here. It's up here in heaven, not down here on earth. And we can make that a reality. 
And by looking and understanding what is being written to us here in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, we understand that the church and our marriage relationship has this similarity. And it's really more spiritual than it is of a physical matter. And that's what we have to understand. When you look at verse 23, chapter 5, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. We need to put in perspective of what that verse is saying, ladies. You know, recently we baptized a young lady into Christ. She really wanted the Lord to be part of her life. But she didn't really understand. She was still seeing herself living in this world and the standards of this world, wanting to bring it into the church. And that being that, wait a minute, why can't women do certain things? And sometimes women look at this, and especially in the world that we live in, I mean, we got women now today who are CEOs of big corporations. But when it comes to the Lord, are we looking and aiming to please Him? That's what this verse is all about. Are we aiming to please God and please, please Him in every aspect of our life and being able to surrender ourselves? It says we've we got to surrender ourselves to each other and to Him especially. Just as God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Men, you are ahead of your wife. But it's not where you lord yourself over her, but where you lead her and guide her spiritually, helping her to grow and to live a sanctified life. Helping her to understand what she needs to see in you about Jesus Christ. Does she see it? Do we see it? Do people see Christ in the church today? In you and me. And verse 28 says, So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. I don't know, when you get older, I don't know if you love your body as much as you did when you were younger. <laughs> well, I'm just being truthful, okay? <laughs> but you do love your body. Because it was what's given to you by God. It's God's gift to you. What, whether you like it or not, it's what you have. It's what he's gave you. What are you going to do with it? Are you giving your body over to God to glorify him? Or are you just complaining about your aches and pains and all the other things that go with it? Are you looking at that you're losing your hair? See, I beat a bunch of you already. You're losing your hair? Is that what you're afraid of? I mean, commercials of guys, you know, buy this product and, and grow your hair more on top of your head. Like that's going to do something to you? Or how about the women? Oh, this is going to keep you young for years and years of going ahead, right? But we forget that our bodies are given to us by God to serve who? Him. Him. And are we doing that? Are we serve, are we doing, are, are, is our bodies going out to what we're doing on a day-by-day -day basis? Our work or whatever? That's great. But is it glorifying Christ in the process? Are we, are we encouraging other people to come to the Lord with our bodies? Or do we look at night in the evening, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, on a recliner, nice and comfortable, watching TV, maybe a favorite sports or whatever? How are we really reaching out to other people to teach them about the truth of God? So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. Listen, he who loves his own wife loves himself. That kind of reminds me of what it says. You are, we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Do you love yourself? See, I know a lot of people that don't love themselves. They're really just kind of, uh, you know, they'll give attention to a lot of different other people, but not give any attention to themselves. And you can't do that. If, if you don't love yourself, you're not going to love anybody else. Think about it. So you've got to think about what you're really living here for. If it's not for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 29. For no one hated his own flesh, 
but nourish it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. But how is that done, people? Getting into His Word. Learning the Bible. And if you don't understand the Bible, it's really easy to understand. It really is. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you the truth. I learned it many, 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 many years ago. And it all came together. And it's all perfect. And you just see how it all fits together. And if you don't have that in your mind, it may be difficult because you just see pieces of it here and there in your life. And you don't really recognize that God had a plan from the beginning that included you. I want us to understand what it is that God has given us. His church, wives and husbands, marriage. And how they are so mystically put together. That we understand how we can build up the body of Christ in such a way that people can see us. And by seeing us, guess what they see? Jesus. Are we aiming for that? Is that really our goal? I pray that it will be. I hope this lesson will get you to think about your relationship with the Lord. And you know what? If, if you haven't been getting together with your wife's husband or others to talk about Jesus during the week, you know why? It's uncomfortable. You don't do it because it's com I mean, you don't even know how to start. You really don't. You don't even know how to start as far as praying together maybe. I don't, I don't know how many of you pray together, husband and wife. It's, 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 it's kind of a, a hard thing to do because you're not used to doing it. But if you just start slowly and just say, yeah, we need to do this and do it. And over time, it will get stronger. It will get better. You'll get closer. And you'll learn more about God's word. And you're going to see do things that God will do in your life that you never saw before. Test me out. And see if I don't say what I'm saying is true. If there's anyone this morning that would like to respond to the invitation of Christ, whether you're at home or here, wherever it may be, we hope that you will respond. Or perhaps as a Christian, maybe you need the courage and the strength to do something different that you haven't done, but you know you need to do it. Why don't you start today with a prayer and praying that God will give you that strength to move forward. If we can help you in any way, please come together. We stand and sing. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner many for the gathering at the harvest home? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the still and solemn night? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, for a harvest pure and wine? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be made? Will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, all along the fertile way? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, you must reap at the last great day. For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home?
seated, please. To help us prepare our minds for gathering around the Lord's table, let's turn to 315. 315. When I survey the wondrous cross. <clears throat> When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but lost. Father, at this time of our worship service, we pause to uh, remember your son's death upon the cross for us, the great sacrifice that was made for every person in the world. We pray, God, that as we do this, that we remember <clears throat> your love for us, your mercy for us, and your grace shown to us. As we partake of this, we ask in your son's name, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again in prayer, thanking you for this, which represents your son's blood shed on Calvary's cross. We pray that each one of us will examine our hearts and partake of this in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray.
Heavenly Father, at this time, we would like to come to you thanking for you for our many, many blessings. And for our Savior that you sent us, that we do have a chance of salvation. At this time, we would like to give back a small portion to further your word. Be with us, guide us, guard us. In his name we pray, amen. Six hundred sixty-nine, six hundred sixty-nine, take my life and let it be. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us this morning. I realize it was a cold, old, bad, miserable morning, but you found your way here. So thank you again. And God, I'm here. <laughs> And God bless you for being with us today. Let's be standing, please. 669. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse. Of thy love, Lord, I give my life to thee, thine forever more to be. Lord, I give my life to thee, thine forever more to be. Yes, sir. <clears throat> 